Okay, so a student shared with me a problem about a ball being tethered with two strings to a rotating rod. And for this problem, what we know is m, the mass of the ball. We know the length of each of the strings, l, and as well as d, which for this particular problem happens to be the same as l, so it forms an equilateral triangle. We know that the, uh, what else do we know? The tension in the upper string, so we know t. Let's maybe call that t1 instead. And what we don't know are going to be T2, the uh, tension in the lower string, which is the first thing we want to find, as well as the magnitude, uh, sorry, excuse me, the net force, as well as the speed of the ball. Because remember that this entire rod is being rotated. So even though the two strings are taut and there's no motion in the plane of the page, there is, however, motion going sort of inwards into the page at this moment, or maybe outwards, who knows. Um, but the point is, this rod is being rotated around. So I think that this problem is not so mathematically challenging. It just requires you to understand the assumption, uh, the, uh, what the assumption of tautness means. So taut is basically equivalent to saying there is a vertical equilibrium. which means that there is no motion uh, upwards or downwards. Uh, there is motion sort of into the page, but uh, everything is sort of at rest up and down. And the reason you can kind of see this is sort of, imagine drawing spheres to represent, excuse me, imagine drawing circles to sort of represent the range of each string. So if there's a circle up there and a circle like this, yeah? So basically you can imagine pivoting the string around, and where the ball exists is going to be at the intersection of these two strings. And the reason tautness implies that it can't move is because, like, say that uh, you tried to move a little bit in this direction. Well, then this other string doesn't have enough length to uh, keep up with the motion. Uh, conversely, if you tried to move a little bit in this direction, well, suddenly the other string isn't taut anymore because now it's inside its sphere uh, with its circle of range. So what this means is that taut implies equilibrium. And because of that, we can basically just set up our vertical equations uh, as we please. Let's just draw the diagram again. But what we have are the tensions, T1 and T2. And the only other force acting on it is gravity. Remember that in the context of physics mechanics, the only invisible force you really have is gravity. Everything else is a tangible thing like a surface or a string or something. But OK. So T1 and T2 are going to be at an angle theta. And uh, this is actually not an unknown. Theta is totally known because you can calculate it based on the length and distance. Uh, you can basically calculate it from the triangle. And if your problem is like the one I see, where L and D are equal, you have an equilateral triangle. So for an equilateral triangle, this is going to be 30 degrees. So at this point, all you have to say is, uh, for the vertical equilibrium, T1, uh, I guess it's going to be sine theta, or sine of 30, minus T2 sine of 30, uh, minus mass times gravity, it's going to be equal to zero. And uh, the only thing we're looking, the only unknown that we're trying to solve for right now is T2. So go ahead and solve. It should not be that hard. Uh, so now the next part is the magnitude of the net force in the ball. Well, okay. So from part A, we said that um, the vertical equilibrium uh, is going to be zero, right? Oh, and to remind you, this is just F is the sum of all forces is equal to ma. And because it, we said it was an equilibrium, acceleration is zero. So for part B, it's not necessarily true that the horizontal Uh, equilib sorry, the horizontal forces, there may be a net force. And what we have to do is essentially just, um, well, add things up, right? 
uh, it shouldn't be that crazy. Now that we know T2, and now that we know T1, all we really have to do is Fnet is equal to T1, uh, I guess it's cosine 30, plus T2 cosine 30. And uh, yeah, I guess that there's not really too much more to it. Just by, there's not really much to part B at all. It's just reminding yourself that once you have the T uh, tension for part A, all you have to do is just add these, add up the horizontal components in order to get the net tension on it. And to remind ourselves that even though we appear to have a free body diagram and that there's no movement in the plane of the page, we do have motion into or out of the page because the rod is rotating, which is why this F net is not zero, right? So for part C, we take the exact same F net and set that equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. So whatever you get from there, just plug that in. And remember that centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. Yeah, that's just one of your very uh, simple basic equations that you should be able to find from your textbook. So if you're being asked to find the speed of the ball, you're looking for the magnitude of the velocity. So at this point, uh, let's just rewrite that a little bit. So we know what F net is, and we know what M is, and R, we don't know right now, but it shouldn't be too hard to find. R is just going to be the radius, right? Uh, the radius from the center of motion, which is just going to be whatever this line is. You're going to have to use a little bit of trick to find out, but that shouldn't be bad at all. That should not be bad. Uh, so this is going to be R. And uh, yeah, after that, just plug everything in and solve for V. That's all, that's all there is to it.